Good. This is Julia Whittup with Talk Story TV, and I have with me today Matthew Palmer, Palm, Palmeri. Palmeri. I did it. <laughs> and uh, so, how did you first uh, receive the call to become a shaman, Matthew? Well, I do want to clarify. Um, I don't call myself a shaman. Okay. But I, I like to call myself a shamanic explorer. Okay. Uh, and for me, that's a big distinction because um, it's getting to be kind of pop culture. And um, I give lectures and invariably some cute little 23-year-old girl will come running up to me. Oh, my boyfriend's a shaman. Here's his business card. You know? <laughs> And so um, I want to run away from that. Uh -huh. to, answer, to, to answer your question, um, as a young man, in fact, as a boy, I was always fascinated with Tarzan and uh, all the wild stuff, you know, and having cheetah and talking to the animals and all those cool things. Yes. And then um, I was very much influenced by the works of Carlos Castaneda. Yes, me too. Yeah, I read all those things maybe three times. I read all the stuff that was critical of it. Uh, my Actually, my anthropology professor went to UCLA with him. And then, um, as a young man, I was also uh, very much fascinated with altered states of consciousness. And uh, as of us did back in the day, especially the 60s and all that, I did a lot of experimentation. And then I got involved deeply into writing and I was researching the lycanthropy mythos and lycanthropy is werewolves and that goes into shape-shifting mythologies and I discovered that um, some of the most concentrated uh, reports uh, in history of shape-shifting went into the Amazon and I realized that there were numerous visionary plants there and traditions and when I made the connection between um, visionary experience and shamanism and shape-shifting, I was obsessed and I had to go to the jungle. So I've been studying it intensely for maybe 30 years and I've been going into the Amazon now for close to 20 years. Uh, I know you have. I researched you a little bit and I was yeah, thank you. Well, we're going to have a really good guest on here. <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, you know, one of the things that drew me into shamanism was the fact that it's a worldwide phenomenon, regardless of whether you're in Siberia or the Amazon or China or some other place, um, all the roots of all the world's religions go back to shamanism. And actually, so do the roots of storytelling, for that matter. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Huh. Yeah. Wow. Um, I, I have a book called Fantastic Fiction with a Ph which grew out of my 25 years of teaching at the Santa Barbara Writers Conference uh, and the Southern California Writers Conference and other places. And what I've traced back is that the essence, are you familiar with the hero's journey? Yes. Stupid question, because this is talk story radio, right? <laughs> <laughs> but um, the root of the hero's journey goes back to the shaman's journey to the underworld where he undergoes, he or she undergoes transformation. So, okay. you know, the, there's the, the whole, in South American shamanism, it's called being swallowed by the jaguar. Um, in other cultures, uh, there's dismemberment. Uh, there's getting your bones taken out and replaced by quartz. There's all these different, uh, the whole uh, Popol Vuh of the Maya, where the hero twins are taken to the underworld, their father is beheaded. All of those dismemberment things are actually, that journey is the essence of the hero's journey. It's where it all comes from. And in the arc of a story, particularly a novel or a film where it's a longer thing, you have the protagonist and the antagonist. And in essence, metaphorically and psychologically, the antagonist is actually the shadow of the protagonist. All the things that he or she fears the most. So um, I've traced all that back to those experiences and now um, all the experiences I've had on the jungle working with the shamans and all the different plants, I've experienced that directly. So I feel like I got a really solid grasp on it and, and the roots of it. Um, and and so, you're, so you're mostly using it to write books? 
Uh, I'm getting inspired by it to help write books, and a number of my books touch on those themes. Not all of them do, but uh, my first big book was Land Without Evil, and it was first contact between the Jesuits and Indians in South America, but it was told from the Indians' point of view. That and was it, different. Yeah, and it, and it came out of uh, an honors course in anthropology I took that was focused on South American Indian religions which uh, fascinated me, even like remote tribes uh, who have hardly been contacted have the myth of the flood. You so know, they no, know about it. Yeah, and in all different cultures, there's the myth of a flood somewhere in there. And so that whole uh, universal roots really, really drew me into it. So I spent years struggling, trying to articulate and write about uh, visionary experience, which by its very nature is non-rational. Right, so it's hard to be fit into language. That's correct. You have to really rely on metaphor. And I try to capture those moments in a way that people who don't get to go to the Amazon, which are most, most people, and articulate it in a way that they can live vicariously through those experiences and get a sense of what they're all about, even though they are indeed non-rational. Um, wow. Really full experience. So you consider yourself not a healer, but an explorer. I'm an explorer. I'm also a healer. I've done ceremony. Um, I recently returned just a week ago from Florida. We did a big exhibit. Uh, it's going to be going on till mid-January at the Appleton Museum in Ocala, Florida, Central Florida. And I did, uh, I did eight, aside from a lecture on shamanism, I did 18 performances, and a dozen of them were sound healing performances. Oh, uh, yeah, one was with a friend of mine, Renee Jenkins, who's out of the Bay Area. He's very good, and he does didgeridoo and um, lots of pipes and pan pipes and flutes and things like that. And I also did a half a dozen with a very dear friend of mine, Tito La Rosa. And uh, Tito is very famous in Peru. He specializes in pre-Columbian instruments. And so I did a half a dozen with him. And I do singing and I do sound healing and I've done sound healing things. But uh, again, I like to think of myself as a shamanic explorer or uh, I practice shamanism um, in my daily life, shamanic practices. But I'm not running around, you know, with white robes and I'm not blessing everybody and, you know, healing the unwashed masses and all that guru stuff. I grew <laughs> uh, guru -itis. Yeah, Guru Itis. <laughs> um, and I had a long discussion with someone years back. And he said, I can call myself a spiritual friend. And that's okay. But um, I don't want to be on any uh, pedestal. In, in my mind and in my everybody is a shaman. It's just that most people don't realize it. We right. Untapped. You know, un untapped potentials, and I've pushed myself physically and psychologically and spiritually in more directions than most, and uh, paid the dues to learn what I what I have to learn. I don't. I'm not comfortable being on any kind of a pedestal. I like to think that if we're all going to New York from San Diego, I, I just happen to leave a few weeks earlier than everybody else, so <laughs> I know the way. But it doesn't make me really any better than anybody, and I'm not, you know, blessing the masses and all those things. So I'm very, very careful about how I um, put myself out there in the world. Um, I, I tend to go, if everybody's going in one direction, I run the other way. It's just in my nature. And, go ahead. Oppositional. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I was told some years ago, and I tend to believe it, that part of my purpose is to bring in the darkness when there's too much light. Oh. And when it's too dark, to bring in the light. And um, I've had some really wonderful experiences doing that. Um, very briefly, I, I went to this big event, and they were doing readings and all that, and everybody was up there reading frou-frou love poems and, you know, all that. And, you know, it was okay for a while, but I kind of kept going on. And um, I was starting to get a little nauseous it was so much of that stuff so I got up there and I read this really dark horror story and um when the event was over all these people came up to me and thanked me for doing that <laughs> they were getting 
Yeah, <laughs> diabetes from all the sweetness. <laughs> yes, well said. Very well said. Good metaphor. Uh, so uh, you know, I really one of the things I I like to tell people is, in my experience with the jungle plants, I have soared through heavenly realms that I can't even describe. And I've also been through the darkest depths of hell, which are difficult to describe. And in my learning, my teaching, and my experience, if you really want to learn, you have to experience the light and the dark. Yes. They're complementary. You can't, you know, I've met so many, as my old coach used to say, all these granola eaters, that's what you would call them. <laughs> like, oh, I just want to see the light and I just want to be, be, be. well, they're missing the point because... The more darkness there is, the brighter the light is, and vice versa, and they are totally complementary. You cannot have one without the other. Right. Um, it's been an important part of my path to uh, experience both, and I've written some pretty dark horror, too. Uh, and uh, and try to uh, find a place for those dark parts of yourself, your shadow side. That is correct. No, acknowledging them. They're abandoned children. And um you know what happens in the hero's journey is the the hero faces their biggest deepest darkest fears and when they face them and accept those uh, denied aspects the denied shadow and and basically start bringing them home then they integrate them and they become more whole more complete in my case uh more intuitive mm -hmm. um i had tons of repressed feminine uh when i was younger and, yeah, you know, and for women, it's repressed masculine. They don't protect themselves and defend themselves because they are repressing that part. Yeah, and, and those are some of the things that we've grown into um, as a society. And when you repress anything, it's going to try and pop out in another way. And that's when the craziness starts to happen. Yes, because it often pops out in a real distorted way. Absolutely. More often than not. Yes. Yeah, for, you know, the whole, uh, all of the sensuality of Dracula and uh, even to some small degree of Frankenstein, you know, there was all that Victorian repression. Yes. And it, ha and it has to come out. And you're right, when it comes out, it, boy, is it ever twisted. Because it's, yeah. it's stuffed away and abandoned and not acknowledged. And, and I think... You know, yeah, yeah. I think a lot of what's going on on Facebook right now with the Me Too thing is women are saying, hey, can we, we can defend ourselves. We never thought of that. <laughs> yeah, no, that's true. I mean, this whole, look where we are now because of all the uh, male domination that's gone on. And the women and repressing their male side, which would have jumped in and protected them. Correct. Correct. And if, you know, there are male qualities and there are female qualities. And just like uh, in the same way where I was talking about, about the light and the dark, they're equally complementary. You, you need one with the other. And when you get those rare occasions where you actually have a good and healthy relationship, then they can really play off of each other and understand that we have both of those inside of us yeah, okay, I'm a male and I'll lean more toward the male side because that's how I am physically and blah, blah, and same with female. But in the end, um, we each have something that's complementary to the other one. Yeah. And it's only by you know, bringing it all together and being unified, um, I think that we can really grow beyond this, you know, all this monotheism, the great big daddy in the sky crap. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. And the great big mama in the earth crap yeah but when they are complementary you know in, in, yeah in the, in the shamanic ceremony you honor the father and you honor the mother and they're yeah. and they're both you know you m women mothers are the portal into this world you know and all the nurturing that they they do and the things that they have to do uh, are, are necessary and it's the same with the whole you know the whole planet and yet you have to have the male energy. If you didn't have the sun, then nothing would grow. And, you know, all those complementary things. So if you don't get the whole big picture, then um, you're going to miss out a lot. 
So yeah. you, you have to well, acknowledge it all. I've been um, starting up cannabis ceremonies here because that's been demonized a lot too. Yeah. That um, plant. Yep, yeah, absolutely. I've I have some very good friends who are leading edge researchers. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm now involved with an organization. What they want to do is they want to host web pages. And the money they make from the web pages, they want to donate for scholarships for uh, treatment of addiction. Oh, using. Yeah, using using uh, entheogenic plants like uh, iboga, ayahuasca, and cannabis. Great, you know, I think that what, would work. I do. I was yeah. an addiction counselor for years, and I just don't. I've I've looked at statistics too, and uh, AA doesn't work that well. No, and it's all we've got. I know, and you know, and the other thing is. If you do any sort of, uh, for lack of better words, intervention with a particular substance, and if you don't follow up with good, solid counseling and psychotherapy after that, they'll just slip right back away again. Yes. You know, uh, I, I don't know if you're familiar with the action of iboga or not. I've heard uh, that it's very effective, and I'd, I'd like to know more about it. Like I can tell you a, a thumbnail of it briefly. Okay. Uh, in fact, one of the first researchers ever, Giorgio Samarini from Italy, I learned from him like 20 years ago. He had done some of the first research. And the Bawidi tribe in Africa will use it, and they have a ceremony where they bury the person, and they feed them the uh, iboga over a two- or three-day period, almost like spoon-feed them. And they go into like a... A coma like right on the edge of life and death and they have this common experience of communicating with the ancestors and the grandfathers and the grandmothers physiologically what happens when you take iboga is the, uh, the iboga actually fits right into the opiate receptors okay so you can beat the actual physical addiction you can kick that in a matter of hours but the experience is so strong, it takes a couple of days to recover. So it's almost like a, uh, typically a weekend thing. And when it's done, it's done also with a nurse who is present 24-7 because you can get, you could die from it. And occasionally people do. But there are clinics down in Mexico and clinics in Vancouver. So people go in and they do their, you know, two or three day thing. They kick the physical addiction. But if they don't go back and get counseling, then they will eventually slip back. So that's really important aspect of it. What about meth? Do you know of anything that gets people off meth? Um, with proper counseling, ayahuasca can. Okay. Um, I'm not sure. I, I think iboga may also have some success with that, but not in the same direct way by plugging the exact I think the action may be a little different, okay. but I've seen, I've seen people who had drinking problems. They had one ayahuasca session and they were done drinking. That'd be nice. Cause that's one of the worst. Yeah. But, um, it's physically challenging. You can have, you can have it for lack of better words and being as tactful as possible. You can have it coming out both ends and it can be very physically unpleasant. Yeah but you get a new perspective when you come out of it. So um, the other one that there's been a lot of research and it's breaking some new ground now is uh, MDMA. Oh, and I've done therapy with that and I, it is effective, very effective. Yeah. And, and Especially again, if you do a nonstop session where you stay with the session for hours and hours as long as, the, as you can yeah. so that you don't break it up into little one hour pieces that leaves you hanging. Yes, that's correct. And, 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 and that's a good point. You have to, even after that session, you need to follow up. Yeah. Yeah. You know, as, as, a, as a counselor, as therapy, uh, so that they make sure that the things that they've explored, um, 
uh, or follow it through. It's, it's like similar with ayahuasca. There are people who will do an ayahuasca session and then they're, um, they have all these, okay, oh, I have all these revelations. And then like a week later, they're like, well, I don't know. And then they start to slip. And if you don't go with what you've learned and experienced and follow through, then it's just a waste of time. And it's not anchored into the psyche. Exactly, exactly. If you get this lesson, revelation, or whatever you want to call it, and then a week later, you just fall back into your own habits and you don't follow through and, and incorporate yeah. that into your life, then you're just wasting your time and you're screwing around. And I've seen a bit of that too. Uh, you know what a shaman said to me yesterday, which really struck me for some reason. I said, why do I keep having reactions to something I've worked so hard on? And he said, well, it's like fixing a cavity. Once the cavity's fixed, you still have to brush and floss and care. <laughs> and I, for some reason, that really hit me. I thought, oh, I'm already fixed. It's just that I'm seeing the effects, the scars, yeah. the effects of the wound. It's, that's, a, that's another really great analogy. You know what? When you see something that you haven't seen, for argument's sake, some aspect of your shadow, and you see it for the first time, you're only catching it for the first time. It's deeply, deeply ingrained. Yeah. And, and your ego slash personality is there almost on remote control, and it's trying to protect you. It's trying to do the right thing. It's just misguided. Right. So the model I like to say is, first you realize it, and then at some point, you know, uh, the emotional energies are the, are the quickest and they tend to mug you. You react before you realize what happened. Yeah. First you see it and then any number of times you find yourself suddenly in the middle of it and you're like, oh, when did that happen? Right? You're, you're part of <laughs> yeah, that was what was happening to me. And I was like, what? I've worked on this. It's, it's supposed to be healed. Why am I having this? Right, and it's not yet. You've just seen it for the first time because it's going to keep coming back and keep testing you. But when you catch yourself in the middle of it a number of times and you get really good at having more awareness, yeah, then you start to see it coming. And then you can stop it from even... Yeah, you can stop it or you can just let it go nuts in your head and keep your mouth shut and don't say <laughs> or do anything. Right? Or let it go nuts in your head and let it play out and do all the crazy stuff it's going to do. And then you can just sit back and be, and be in, you know, I like to call it witness mode or observer mode. Yes, witness uh, mode. I like that. Yeah, yeah. And I always like to say either daddy's home or mommy's home. You know? <laughs> because they're all abandoned children. They're all basically, for the most part, infantile. And as you know, uh, they can go all the way back to the womb and, and, and maybe even further. I'm, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with Stanislas Graf's uh, oh. practices. Well, and they're discovering it does change the DNA when there's trauma. Yeah. So it's trauma in the family and it'll go pass on to the children. Yep. That's right. In in, in more ways than people they will care to admit. Yes. You know, well, and then there's all the crazy projection stuff that goes on and, you know, those kind of things. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wow powerful stuff well i'd love to see you come to grand junction at some point I, i've yeah. been there before um yeah. i've really been in the mix out here and uh, one of the great things about the uh library uh, and i'm sorry the museum event that i just recently did is all my buddies from peru and from the jungle they came up for it oh how cool yeah wow maybe i could talk our museum into doing something like that if you could or you find a connection, let me know. Okay. Have the pieces. Like, I'm going to be approaching the Museum of Man here in San Diego. Right. Uh, we have somebody uh, who says they have a connection at Harvard. Okay. And we did. So uh, at the opening of this event, they expected 150 people. Yeah. And we had 277. Wow. More than twice. Yeah, and, and my, uh, my lecture on shamanism, they were expecting 60 people, and I had 133. Wow, okay. So, I will go talk to them. Yeah, and 
use my name in vain, throw me at them. Okay, I will. <laughs> in fact, you know what I'll do too is um, I'll forward you, I got a little email. I took a few personal pictures um, and some other things of the whole exhibit in the event. Okay, then, let's, uh, I'm going to close off this show and we'll and turn off the recording and we'll talk and make arrangements for that. Okay. But meanwhile, thanks for being on my show. Thank you for having me. Um, MatthewPalamary.com or MattPalamary.com. M-A-T-T, P as in Paul, A-L-L-A, M as in Mary, A-R-Y.com. Google that. My webpage will come up. Everybody's welcome to come visit. I have videos, audio, podcasts, TV shows, radio shows. I got the whole enchilada, including you, young lady. Me? Yeah. I'm gonna when we when this is done and recorded, I'm gonna post you all over the internet. All right. <laughs> Thank you. And maybe I'll get some more shamans coming here. I'm I know it's a small, isolated area, but I'm asking shamans to come as a community service mm -hmm. to isolated areas yeah now if i can do it i will for sure i really appreciate the invite okay thank yeah. you thank you